your hair cut way up high Get yourself a lawyer, son You're gonna need a real good one Indeed, it is time to be joined by David Whiting. Good morning, David. Good morning, Ali. It's not quite the same not having you here, but that's okay. It's the oh, world we live in. Hoping. Yep, yep. <laughs> now, Life's I've, different at the moment. It is, it is. Really, I've, I was. All, I almost said a rude word then. No, you know. <laughs> um, David, I have a piece of paper in front of me that indicates that you had quite a bit of homework. No, I had two bits of homework. I was so one, I had one bit of homework. Um, there's a lady, Mary, who rang, and Mary lives in a house in Doncaster, and uh, there's quite a bit of moisture in the soil under her property that she thinks is attributable to drainage. Uh, she's the third owner, property developed some 40 years ago, and the question was, was there any responsibility that the council had for allowing the subdivision all of those years ago? And uh, I promised to go off and look. And, uh, well, my first problem is, is we have this piece of legislation called the Limitation of Actions Act, which basically puts a cap on the amount of time you have in which to commence proceedings. And uh, my, so my first reaction for Mary is that she's way out of time on that. And what she ought to do is look and see whether there any, have been any changes in the last few years in her area that have altered the drainage. The Water Act is, if I was looking, in terms of a planning issue, I think she's way out of time from a council perspective. There may be some residual obligations that council and other landowners have under the Water Act, and that's where I would start looking. Okay. Mary, I hope you're listening. And you also had Nerida from Turak. Nerida had a fascinating question that I had to deal with for a client the following day. Oh, really? That was coincidental? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that was interesting was that... uh, in fact, it was on the Friday because the rules changed several times that week. And what it was the issue in Nerida's case was that she lives in a small block of units. One of the other residents in the unit is getting some building work done in their property. And it then becomes a question of... Uh, because they, they changed the rules in relation to building work, I think, three times last week uh, about what you could do and what you couldn't do. And my client's situation was that she's getting a house built on a block of land which has the current cottage that she lives in. And the question is, did she, could she stay there? Because the builder told her that he'd got advice that she had to leave. And if she didn't leave and he did building work, she'd be up for $5,000 a day and he'd be up for $90,000 a day. So uh, it was a similar situation. You um, for construction work, you can't be there as the owner. You need to go somewhere else. That creates other issues in relation to whether your primary residence is available or not available. But uh, in the circumstances that Nerida had, um, she wasn't in a position where she could stop the construction, even though she had concerns with other peoples in the block of units about the construction work being going undertaken because the each unit would be a separate building site. And that's it. Okay. But I think you also wanted to tell us something about Clive Palmer. This is a fascinating case. I mean, (laughs) Clive Palmer versus Western Australia. Well, uh, Clive Palmer's company, Mineralogy Proprietor Limited, had an agreement with the Western Australian government in relation to mining. And there was a dispute which has arisen and they're going off to arbitration or they were going to arbitration in November. Because doesn't and isn't the claim amount to the entire state's GDP? The claim is $30 billion. Mm, rather a lot. Now, it were a huge amount of money and the claim arises because the, the indications are that the, the Western Australian government did something it should not have done. Uh, Now, what happened was that last week the Western Australian government passed a piece of legislation that it doesn't really matter what an arbitrator might say, it doesn't matter what a court might say, it doesn't matter what's gone wrong, but the answer is we ain't paying. So it gets gets very interesting and um, no doubt it will go to the High Court. Each of the states has a cap on its jurisdiction and that is they can make laws for the peace, order and good government of their state, and that's the limit. Um, It doesn't have the kind of provision in the Constitution of Australia which says there shall be no expropriation without compensation. 
So if there was a piece of, if this was a Commonwealth dispute, the Commonwealth couldn't legislate like this. And the real question is whether or not the state government in Western Australia has overstepped its powers. So it will be fascinating. It will drag on for some years. It'll, it'll go for years, won't it, if it's going to go to the Oh, yeah, court. absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But, you know, you've got to... Um, look, while I'm... I wouldn't call Clive my favourite person, um, there are some elements of what he does that I at least smile at. Yep. <laughs> but I, I guess are you, are you leaning there towards saying that these sorts of things do need to be tested? Oh, absolutely. I, I'm the answer... You know, someone's come along and done an... Um, the Western Australian government has come along and said, we're just not going to pay. So can you really do it's that? It's not a question of the rights or the wrongs. It's effectively mm. the government says, we're not paying. Mm. doesn't really matter what the rights and wrongs are. We're not paying. Well, let's see what the High Court says. Yes. one three hundred triple two seven seven four is the number if you have a question for David Whiting or you can text 0437 774 774. Kay in Heidelberg. Good morning, Kay. Oh, good morning, and thank you for taking my call. David, last week you, I think it was last week, you talked about um, an, an issue around fencing, and I think it was overhang in terms of fencing, and I was just wondering where that fine line is in terms of um, fence boundaries. I'm not talking about the literal boundary, but um, um, I, I'm sure you mentioned something about the posts and the rails on which side okay, what, the fence... What... Yeah, the, the overhanging <coughs> argument was over trees. Yeah, I think that's And whether you can, you can, whether you can get adverse possession because your trees overhang your neighbour's property, and the answer to that's no. Uh, in terms of fencing, the, what we talk about is what's the fence line? Because clearly the fence line isn't a foot thick. The fence line is a very precisely drawn line, and it's on the face of the posts next to the palings. Does that make sense? So a, a paling is generally about a sort of paling. A post is a, generally a hundred mil square. Yep. So there's a in the old language there's a four inch difference between one side of the post and the other. So the yes. fence line is the the side of the post closest to the palings. So if, if in, technically, <laughs> technically the palings end up on one person's property and the posts end up on the other. Does Thank that answer you. your question, Kate? Good luck achieving it. it that's it, all it I can say, Kate. certainly does. Right. Thank you very much for your help. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> no. uh, Margaret in Carnegie. Hi, Margaret. Thank you. Um, uh, my question is also about a fence. Um, a block of flats um, uh, where the four of the ground floor flats uh, have a little garden uh, which is in, in part bound by the uh, main boundary fence between that that block and the one next door. Um, if part of the fence uh, bounding a garden um, needs some attention, um, who pays for that? Is it the, the resident or the body corporate, please? Or the owners corporate. All right. So someone. So there's. Let's let's say there are four units, uh, all of whom backyards that run up to the side fence. That's right, yeah. And then, and one of them is damaged. Mm. The, it's the responsibility that falls between the owner next door and the owner of the unit. So it's not okay. an owner's... There's no... You, one doesn't argue that there's an infinitesimally small line that the owner's corporation's responsible for the fence. It's the boundary okay. fence of the unit owner. Okay, thanks so much. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Margaret. Uh, Julia in Ascot Vale. Hi, Julia. Good morning, David and Ali. Uh, thank you for taking my call. I have previously called about a month ago about my situation with a mobile phone that was supposed to be supplied to me by my company as per my contract when I started back in July 2018. Um, Julia, I remember the call. Yeah, so um, David... Since then, in my final payment, um, as I said to the CEO that I would keep the phone since it was in my name and that the contract had finished, um, in my final pay, they have deducted $1,000 for the phone and have also failed to pay me for the final bill, which was June, July, which was when I was employed by them still. Okay. Julia, can I say that's a call which has troubled me quite a bit since we spoke? Mm -hmm. uh, about what's right and what's not right, and it would require 
So, so uh, Ali, Julia had a, a contract, and the contract said, we will supply you with a mobile phone and mobile phone number. In fact, what they did after they signed the contract was they sent Julia off to a telephone company and told her to sign her own contract and they would reimburse her, which is what they did. And the question arises as well, at the end of the phone contract, who owns the phone? Because Julia got terminated the 30th of June, Julia? Uh, yes, July 28th. Yes. July 28th, you got terminated and Julia rang to ask, well, who does the phone belong to? And I told Julia that I thought the phone was hers. Um, I think it requires a, you know, a better analysis of the employment contract because, you know, I can see because the company will be of the view that they paid for the phone and that they met all of the obligations in relation to the phone and you've kept the phone. So I, you know, while the advice I clearly gave you three weeks ago, two weeks ago, was that the phone was yours, I'm, I'm wavering from that on okay. the basis that they've made all of the payments. Now, you've kept the phone, and mm -hmm. the real question then becomes is, well, if they're allowing you to keep the phone, what's the value of the phone that you're keeping? I assume that's why they deducted the $1,000 from your final pay, Julia. Is that your assumption? Yes, well, that was written on the payslip that it was for the mobile phone. And um, I have since spoken to the telco and said, what is the value of the phone? And they have said it's something in the payout value of $270. No, not the payout value under the contract, because that's a different question. Uh, the question would really be, what's the market value of the phone? So if you were to look on Gumtree or eBay or one of those, there will be a market for your phone and specification oh. in its condition. Okay. So I would have thought that if there was to be a deduction, that's what it ought to be, or you might go back to them and say, um, you know, the, the price you put on the phone isn't acceptable, I want it back. I, you know, I'm giving it back to you. But you've got to pay me the balance of the contract that I took out on your direction. Okay. That so, David, you, you don't think the company will simply be charging Julia what it has paid for the handset during the course of the contract? No. no okay, only what because, it is because, worth because, at the end. Because at the moment it's only worth... It's simply a question of what's the phone worth now because for the last two years she's used it. Mm. It's like we'd be saying, well, I'll provide you with a company car and at the end of the time you pay out the contract, you don't pay the price that the car was when you bought it. Mm. I get that. one three hundred triple two seven seven four is the number if you would like to speak with David if you've got a legal question or you can text 0437 774 774. Peter in Pasco Vale. Hi, Peter. Good morning. Good morning. My um, issue is around, around the building regulations for overlooking. My neighbour built a studio back in 2007 and... Um, you had to screen it, obviously, to comply with the regs. But yes. um, in February this year, he painted the studio and removed the screening. Yes. And um, between February and May, I spoke with him, or well, three times, but um, he's very busy and can't replace it. Um, I, I wrote to the VBA then and uh, to enforce the building regs, and they've replied back saying, uh, yes, the studio is in breach of the regs, but due to the... Um, Limitation of Actions Act 58, they um, cannot enforce it and I should seek legal advice, so here I am. So here you are. Peter, I, can I say I don't accept the VBA's argument? Um, okay. I'd actually, I'd actually start at a different point. In, in order to build the building that he's got, he will have got a planning permit. It will have been issued by the local council and right. one of the requirements in the planning permit will be the need for a screen. Okay. Right. So that's a, um, uh, as a general proposition, that would be an ongoing commitment for the use of the property. So the oh, right. answer might be to go to council, get a copy yep. of the planning permit right. and find out whether or not that's a condition on it. If it is, then you would go to council and say he's no longer complying with the planning permit. I want you to stop him using the studio. All oh, right, okay. Um, All right. So it's a planning permit, not a building permit. That, no, there's two, there's two separate questions. In, in order to build what he's built with the overlooking, he's mm. undoubtedly needed to get a planning permit. 
Right. Otherwise, thanks. he would never have put the screen on. Okay. Yep. Now, uh, some planning permits have... Uh, so, for example, a planning permit to build a building and finish it uh, would often say that it needs to be completed within a period of two or four years. Right. I think that because there's a screening requirement, that will be an ongoing requirement in the permit which is still enforceable. Oh, right, okay. So the council right. and I will... the enforcement... Um, yeah, you go to council about the enforcement because he's he got a planning permission on the basis that he put the screen up and he's now taken it down. Right, okay. And see if he can find the time now. Good luck, Peter. We hope that that helps. Um, Leo in Ormond. Hi, Leo. Oh, hi, Ali and David. Um, look, my uh, question relates to uh, uh, trouble refunds. I've been reasonably successful in getting refunds back from a couple of suppliers, but I've hit a bit of a wall with one supplier who's relying on the who is relying on the term force majeure uh, not to um, pay it a refund, but is offering yep. a... Um, a uh, credit to the end of uh, December this year, which is probably theoretically uh, impossible to um, to uh, accept. So, what, what's right. your question? So, what does the term force majeure mean? And is this an all-encompassing phase that sort of means they don't have to pay out? Uh, it might, um, but it's, it's. I think it's law French or ancient French, and it means a major force. But it would. It's something. Uh, you might call it an act of God, a war, a strike, a riot. Um, you'd, you'd actually need to work out whether the non-performance was caused by a force majeure or not. Well, but as a general proposition... Beg your pardon? It's been caused by the pandemic. Uh, and, and can I ask, what was it you contracted to buy, Leo? It was a, um, a walking expedition tour in Italy from uh, Orvieto to Rome. And does that mean that they're not running the tour... Or does it mean you can't get there to walk for tour? Oh, it's an independent type thing. You can do it any time of the year, but then um, right. Uh, so, so the but but, but you know, see, this is um, it's a question of um, you know. Let's assume that I had a walking tour and there was an airline strike, so I couldn't go and do the tour, but the tour still ran. That, in my mind, is not a force majeure event. Because, but you know, if you were going uh, near Pompeii and the and the volcano exploded and you couldn't go at the time you'd booked, that's a force majeure event. You you would need to. How long ago did you book, Leo? Well, we booked last November, and the tour right. was uh, was to go in. Oh well, it was an independent walking tour, so and we were to due to do that. You in could April. have gone at any time, but you were going at a certain time. Yep. Yeah, we're going April. We'd booked to go in April. But that's well before COVID was exactly, on exactly. the horizon. Well, exactly. What we thought, oh, yeah, yeah. You mean the booking or the tour? The, because we we uh, it was the fifteenth of March when the uh, when the federal government basically said let's close the borders. Yep. Look, it's it may or may not be a force majeure event. One of the things you need to do is look at the terms and conditions, and well, it, it might be in the terms. I beg your pardon. It so, does mention the term force majeure. In the yeah, terms. I think the other thing that you would look at is the Australian Consumer Law and Fair Trading Act and look at the sections in relation to frustration mm -hmm. and see whether they give you some pleasure or, or some benefit. Mm. But my view would be it may not be a force majeure event. David, it's so hard. I mean, I know that these questions have been constant, really, since February or March when everyone's had to change their travel plans. But it's, um, you know, <laughs> some companies were claiming that we knew about things that we didn't know about, you know, <laughs> when they say that we did, but in actual fact we didn't. And there doesn't seem to be any hard and fast rule on, on when, you know, when it's deemed to be something like force majeure. Because you have to have, for them to... to Mean, for you not to get the service that you paid for on the basis of force majeure, um, I mean, how how does that work in the context of something like a pandemic as opposed to a hurricane or a cyclo cyclone or something like that, which we often hear the term referred to? You know, for example, mineral exports might be disrupted and then they declare force majeure on a contract they can't deliver because of a hurricane. It's very different to a pandemic, which has different stages of notification. Um, I, I think the problem with the pandemic, Ali, is that we're confusing um, the actual event and the things that surround it. 
So if you were to book a walking tour for Italy, sorry, we're picking on you, Leo, but you book a, a walking tour for Italy and all of a sudden you, there is a plane strike and you can't get there, but the walking tour still goes on just without you, um, that's not a force majeure event because the event's still occurring. Um, uh, and at the moment, so if the government closes the borders that says that you can't, so you can't leave Australia, but the accommodation you've booked in Oslo or London or Johannesburg is still available, then that too is probably not a force majeure event mm, because okay. all they need to do is keep the room open for you on the day and if you don't turn up, you don't turn mm, up. That's your loss, not, not yes. theirs. Yep. That's, a, that's why the travel insurance becomes even more important. Yeah. Look, I've got a quick question uh, on the text which I just want to put to you, David. Uh, this is Lynn in the Grampians who says, My will and title recently was moved from one law company to another without my knowledge. The first company was moving from town and advertised their closure and transference of documents in the local paper. I don't get it. Question, shouldn't they have emailed or mailed their clients of this occurrence? Uh, There's a requirement that when somebody closes their practice, they are required to notify their clients and you can go to the Legal Services Board and ask for a notice to be advertised rather than individual. So that's what they've done. So, look, for example, I... uh, Look, a long time ago, I was a partner in a firm called Stedman Cameron, which traced its antecedents back to the early 20th century. So I've got wills in my deed storage that are 100 years old. I'm absolutely certain that the people who are, who are in the wills are dead, well and truly. But um, I've got them because there's nowhere I can send them. So in the same way, and, and you know, where you get, so I might make a will and five years later someone will go to another lawyer and make a different will and nobody ever tells me. Right. So the way you deal with it is you get permission to do some advertising. But normally it would be appropriate to contact each client and say... If they're an I'm active closing, client. I'm merging. Hmm. Bigger button. If they're an active client. Uh, Ali, what's an active client? <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the sense that, um, you know, I, as people say, it's, gee, David, it's really nice to talk to you again. I haven't spoken to you for 10 years, but you're still my lawyer. Yes. So is that an active client? No. The answer is yes in the in the eyes of the client, but there's no no f- current file. No, indeed. And one might make a will and then walk away for a couple of decades and not come yes. back. Mm. In fact, I think our family's guilty of that. I might have a child that's not in the will. <laughs> which is not, not, I shouldn't laugh about that. That's not good. Um MJ in Safety Beach. Hi, MJ. Hi, how are you going, Ellie? Good, thanks. Thank you, thank you so much for lifting the veil on our, our current COVID situation enough to look at some pertinent issues. Very much appreciated. Just on the coattails of the um, previous councillor's statement on the proposal for the gas project, the AGL gas imported facility that is um, bringing or proposing to bring a floating storage and regasification unit into Western Port. This is the one that the council voted against last night. Yes, that's correct. Mm. And um, there is a nine day window for public refute to that particular EES, which is what um, Sam was explaining, is the environment, environmental effects statement. I encourage the listeners to go and check out www.gasimportprojectvictoria.com. Um, and have just you got have a, a question for David Whiting, MJ? Um, well, David, I'm just wondering what stance we have in being able to refute Jacinta Allen's decision as the Minister for Transport in relation to the go-ahead of construction for the Western Victorian Highway and the um, the quick ABC television news broadcast dedicated approximately 10 seconds midweek last week to update its viewers on the statement that the proposed Victorian Western Highway upgrade is to go ahead, nothing more. So we're not. So your question is not about the hub. Your question is about the highway. Let me just quickly put that to David. Yeah. David. So I, I suppose you've you've still got. Uh, is there? There's a process in the legislation for major projects. I imagine this is a major project. 
Yeah, but the um, issue that we have here is the Indigenous peoples of the Jabwarung Nation uh, have been refuting this particular project because it threatens their 800-year-old birthing trees that have been here since, you know... Well, 800 years, in fact. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. <laughs> Indeed, but uh, for the importance of it, it could be listed as UNESCO World Heritage listed, like Budge Bim well, has well, been then, done. Well, then, then perhaps, perhaps. I mean, I'm not going to be able to give you an answer in the time frame that you've, you that you need your nine day opportunity. But look, I'll, I'll talk about it next week, MJ. I shall go and have a look. All right, MJ, thank you for your call. That's homework for David. David Whiting, thank you. Pleasure, Ellie. Yet again. Um, and uh, you'll come back with your homework and talk to Virginia next week.